Yeah. So just to tell you, we'll talk to uh, Professor Jonathan Janssen coming up just now regarding his take about education and how broken it's been and uh, and how we move from a good education to broken. We'll talk about that just now. Uh, I suppose we could say that about the whole country. There's so much that's wrong, isn't it? But with me is Lorenzo Davids. He's the executive director of the Justice Fund and the Development Impact Fund. And uh, nowadays, better known as the guy who rides the trains in uh, in the Western Cape. Uh, Lorenzo, appreciate your time. Good morning. Okay, we will hopefully connect with Lorenzo in just a moment. There's just been a slow connection that we may be having. Um, so just bear with me on that, right? Uh, let me tell you what else is coming up. We'll chat about the... Um, in fact, we're going to chat to Habib, uh, Professor Habib Nurbai as part of the series that we've had about how do you champion South Africa. So that should be a fascinating conversation. And we'll touch base with the... Uh, with the Furyenichen Mosque, okay, as part of uh, the feature we've had, we'll be looking at the most significant mosques, um, historically significant mosques uh, in South Africa. And uh, Ashraf uh, Gangrakar uh, is always pretty fired up. We'll talk about freedom. How do you get fired up about freedom? We'll see about that. Okay, I think we, I just want to see whether we are connecting. We're having a problem with some connectivity. And if not, we may just have to do a plan B with uh, with regard to Lorenzo and see how we can actually talk to him. So my <laughs> um, my apology for that. By the way, um, I think we, we seem to be getting the pictures now, so that should hopefully be fine. I wonder what you make, uh, an interesting one. Um, the You know the discussion we had uh, the other day regarding uh, pick and pay and pick and pay uh, wishing people of the Muslim faith, uh, Ramadan Mubarak on the one hand, but on the same poster uh, selling ham, which as you know, is alien to the to the Muslim and the Jewish faith, by the way. Uh, and of course, they've they've apologized for the error of their ways. But, but the broader conversation has been from other people, like why are they even getting into our spaces? They're just being opportunistic. Um, and I see the CNA uh, now has got fabulous displays, by the way, about all things Eid. Um, which, which my family were pretty impressed. Now, my take on that is in a society where, where minority communities, wherever they are in the world, are in fact sidelined for being minority communities and being other compared to the majority, I think any opportunity for, for your culture, for your beliefs, uh, for, for the things that you do uh, to be mainstreamed, I think is, in my opinion, impressive. So I'm like, what do you want? You Are you trying to tell me? So if you're saying that CNA has got um, a whole display for Eid, and if you're saying, no, CNA mustn't do that, they're being opportunistic, what are you then suggesting that if, if you're having a, a shop that sells um, pies and samosas and kheer and buber, are they not being opportunistic as well, even if they're Muslim-owned? Like, where do you stop? Um, if, if someone promotes uh, Islamic way in Ramadan, uh, are they not doing what marketers normally do, taking advantage, not in a negative sense, about the reality of the situation that people have to buy? So if people have to buy, you have people who need to sell. And if they make a profit, well, good for them. That means there's less dependence on the state, isn't it? So my thought about, uh, about the CNA example, uh, and they're not the only ones, I, I think that's the way to go, whether it's the CNA, whether it's Woolworths, whether it's Pick and Pay, whether it's others who, who now sell halal goods on the one hand who uh, you know meets but also selling and targeting the the muslim community uh reflecting the fact that it's ramadan or eid so for me that's what you want that's what makes the country what it is to be as inclusive as possible no matter what your beliefs are on the other hand they will do something for the hindu community and the jewish community and and other aspects that may come up um soon provided they see there's a big enough market so i think okay right so the plan a was to was to speak to Renzo david's visually i think we've had some problem with that connection we're going to go plan b and maybe that's the plan b for the country as well Renzo david's good checking to you and thanks for your time Good morning, Ashraf. Good to be with you. Sorry about all the difficulties with uh, coming online with you. No, well, well, maybe maybe it's a, it's a good thing. It's not it's not that it's a good thing, but maybe it's it's a it's an accurate reflection and depiction of of just how much of what we're doing as a country is being lost in translation because of bad lines, isn't it? Absolutely, it, it is very insightful that yeah we, we struggle uh, to make the connections we need to make to run a successful country. Very very apt yes. description. Yeah, so so it, it does tell me. So here's the thing. I mean, I, I, yesterday, uh, of course, being Freedom Day, right? And and I mean, I commented to say so much to celebrate, but there's still so much to do, right? 
and, and many people concur with me. On the other hand, there are many others who are saying, like, what is there to celebrate? This is a failed state or a failing state. And, and therefore, I thought, let, let's you and I have this conversation um, around where we are as, as a country. So maybe just the first thing, right? Uh, so Freedom Day, is there much to celebrate? The answer to that is exactly the answer that we struggle with in this country. There is a cautious yes, there is an emphatic no. And both of those answers are true. Cautiously, yes, we are free. We have the right to vote. We have a democracy that is, that is founded on a strong constitution. Beyond that, there is a very muted, uh, uh, a very emphatic no, nothing else works, quite frankly. And we have to be honest about that. From transport to energy to uh, uh, active citizenship, very little to celebrate around the freedoms that the Constitution uh, mm -hmm. poses on us. Very little to celebrate. Because I've, I've suggested that, you know, we probably need to have our own scoreboard of 20 things and we may find 10 things that are pretty good um, and, and impressive and beacons of light around the world. And then there are obviously 10 things that you mentioned a few that are absolute disasters. I think the key part, and this will segue into our real conversation, is the 10 things that are bad are the things that impacts, not ideologically, but impacts onto the day-to-day -day living examples uh, of, of people around the country. And that's why they literally are mo far more cutful for example, as someone uses a South African phrase, versus uh, another who says, but actually we've got a great constitution, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and it's time that we, we stop uh, lauding the constitution. The constitution is a fact. It's not being changed. It's not under threat in any particular way right now. So the constitution is a moot, is a moot point. It's, it's, it exists. constitutional promises and constitutionally enshrined and liberal. That's where we are failing. So the president, the ministers, the DGs can get up on a platform and tell us how great the constitution we have and how safe the democracy is, but beyond that, in terms of what the constitution promises us, that's where we are horribly failing. Yeah, yeah. Which then brings me to, to the point of the discussion, really, which is I'm suggesting that for many people in South Africa, there's a sense of no hope and, and how, therefore, do we move from a state or position of no hope to a state or position of hope? Yeah, I, I think that, that we're sitting in, in a crisis right now. We, we, we do, do have a situation of growing no hope. Um, you know, we can't have a president that is always surprised. We can't have a president that is so ill-informed that he doesn't know uh, that basic infrastructure is collapsing, that at municipal levels, Ashraf, we have municipalities without clean water, without a health infrastructure, with failing sanitation systems. So you have this, these cascading uh, blocks of, 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 of uh, infrastructure collapse that is taking place. We can't sit from an office where we see smart buildings and a nice desk and an IT system that works and not realize that we are of the few, the many in the country exist with a collapsing infrastructure. That's the reality. So, so the no hope scenario is a growing scenario. It is, the, it is the normal scenario in the country. Those of us who have hope have hope because we have resources. We have our own uh, energy generators. We have our own IT infrastructures. But the country's premise is a premise of no hope at the moment because the government infrastructure, the government energy resources, that's collapsing, that's failing. And it seems like there is a disconnect to that reality from, from those who, who run government and those who sit and ponder policy in this country. Because am I right in saying, you know, we've, we've, had, uh, we've had a few you know, crises in the last few years, uh, the obvious one, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and there was a, a response to that, which, which and the response was equal to the crisis insofar as saying, we, are, we have this fight against the unseen enemy. If I remember President Ramaphosa saying it on, on day one as we were moved into lockdown, right? Uh, and then, of course, we, we had the, the KZN riots um, and then coupled with that possible uh, uh, armed insurrection. And then just recently, the, the KZN floods. Now, in all cases, government responded with a sense of urgency. Um, but the broader issue of, of South Africa, Inc., as a country in crisis, that, that urgent response you know, to reduce it from a pandemic to a, to a uh, endemic in, in South Africa. I mean, we, we don't see that, right? Yeah. 
In fact, I would not say that government responded with a sense of urgency. Government responded with a sense of verbosity. There were verbal commitments to urge urgency. There wasn't an urgency actually in the system. And that is what is true throughout the country. We don't have an actionable urgency. We do have urgent statements. We do have commentary made by politicians to and fro about how important it is and how they are on the scene and how they will ensure that this happens. And the minister will visit the township or the premier will pitch up at a crisis point. But the urgency that goes from verbal to action is missing. So there isn't an urgency in the deliverable. You know, I was, I was, I was on a train this morning and, and talking to people just in conversation as I ask people their comments about rail safety. And people mm. say to me that, you know, after Freedom Day, they'll come back on a train and they have the same despair that they had the day before Freedom Day. They don't find that there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a response from government to understand how, how complex their challenges are to make a decent living in this country. So if it's famous late, nobody will tell the commuter, listen, your train is going to be late. Nobody on that station says, listen, your train is going to be late. So you're going to lose, lose an hour's wages because your clock card is going to show that you clocked in an hour late. That hour late wage deduction on that person's salary means the difference between eating a meal and not eating a meal. That's how important this is. And if you don't go down to that granular level of understanding how our lack of urgency impacts the ordinary person who will lose an hour or two's wages, then we don't understand what it means to run and function in democracy. And do you get a sense that, that in this case, obviously government, meaning the ruling party, uh, in, in all their pronouncements say in the last few years, certainly since uh, President Ramaphosa has, has taken the hot seat, that, that they've been truly critical in identifying how vulnerable they've been in terms of governing the ruling party and therefore governing the country? Yeah, I, I, I think that, <laughs> I said it a while back, it almost appears as if the current government is long to be in the opposition because the task of governance is to own the risk for them. It's too great a responsibility. They would rather prefer to chirp from the side than to actually lead the process. Because it's strange that it is the ANC members, it's the governing party's members who are protesting in service delivery protests. It's the, it's the own members who protest against lack of salaries. It's in ANC municipalities that you find that there's dissatisfaction about these things. And I am not a proponent of any government, uh, a political party. I've not been a member of a political party. But it mm. is insightful that we have, it is, it is the ANC as governance party who also, on the other side, protest how poor the processes are when you come to their communities and municipalities. And, and that, for me, is insightful. So the very party that's governing also have its municipalities protesting at how poor the services are. Yeah, and when that happens, I mean, that, that's a huge problem, right? Let, so, so therefore, in terms of so acknowledging that we have a problem, acknowledging there's a sense, by and large, for the majority of citizens of our country, of a sense of no hope, and still having this desire to move to a position of hope, right? Uh, I mean, you've got some, some specific thoughts about what needs to be done. What, what are they? Yeah, first of all, I think that we need to get three things that must take place. Uh, a, there must be good policy setting. We, we have a disastrous policy setting mechanism. We have all the tools to be good at policy setting, but we are poor at policy setting. And so there isn't a consistency both in how the declarations are made or policies are set and in its applications. So you can go from town to town, municipality to municipality, district municipality to district municipality, and even in provincial governments, and we have such vast differences of how policy functions. I think what gives any person security is when the message is consistent. We do not have a consistent message, in other words, a consistent policy uh, setting framework in this country. And so you can go and look at municipal services, bus services, you can look at water provision, you can look at sanitation, and they differ across the country. Why? Because there's a mess at policy setting. We do not set the standards appropriately, and unless that happens, unless we have competent persons who know how to set policy that translates into good quality services across municipalities, we are going to keep on failing. So some guy thinks that a three-inch pipe is good enough because the policy says, you know, be between three and eight inches uh, a pipe is, is what should be used. No, you have to be consistent about what is good quality piping. Um, mm. You have to be consistent mm. about what is good quality services. You can't leave that up to individuals to decide because I'll tell you this, the lowest 
the lowest common denominator will always be the winner. So the lowest poor quality service, the lowest tender, the lowest fee will always be the one that gets the deal. And that may not always be the best service. So yeah, honestly, the thing that, I, that, I'm, that I'm in about is, is that we have to be good at governance. And good, good policy setting and good governance uh, uh, are, are twins in, in, in what creates a successful state. If those two are absent, you're beginning to border on a completely failed state because the first signs of a failed state is that the, the governance people don't know that their policies are not working. The, the, so, so, the, therefore, so, so therefore, how, how good, and I say with a broad smile, how, how good is our governance? <laughs> it, it's <laughs> pathetic. Quite frankly, it is pathetic. Uh, we, we, are, we are, South Africa is right now, internationally out of the countries of the world, we are the king with no clothes on. We literally think we are doing well. We are literally competing in BRICS forums and in UN forums and in World Bank forums and in, and in uh, uh, you know, European Union forums and in Geneva. We pitch up for conferences. Uh, we are the king with no clothes on. We literally are. Uh, we don't understand that we are so poor at governance. We are the laughing stock of the world in many instances. And I say that with respect to my country because I'm a patriot. I love this country. I will die here. I will not leave this country. I'm committed to its success. But boy, are we fooling ourselves that we are doing well. We will drive with Mercedes Benzes and BMWs and blue lights through horribly poor townships and that's a good image. My goodness, how can we not be deceived to think that that conveys a good message? It's not. It's a bad message to our people. And we need to be able to get down to grassroots level and, and translate what we believe is necessary for our country into how we govern our country, and that's missing. Okay, and, and the third, uh, the three, the three goods. What, what's your third one? My third one is that if you don't have good policy setting, Ashraf, and you don't have good governance, you begin to lose the goodwill of the people, mm. and that, that for me is, is severe. South Africa, the South African state, the South African government, its parliament has lost the goodwill of the people. In fact, you know, you, we watch the state of the nation address nowadays. I did a poll with just my friends recently. And I said, what do you want to say to the nation of this? And they, they literally watch it to see what chaos is going to happen, not what the president is going to be saying. Mm -hmm. I believe that this, this sacred assembly that happens once a year in our country is now being watched not for its quality content, but for its comedic antics. It is bizarre that we all tune in to watch what comedic antics is going to happen and not what the president is going to be saying. So, so what, what comes first on the, on the goodwill? I mean, so, so we're given the three good policy, good governance, good will, and yet we need to turn that around. Uh, so, so what should come first in terms of priority? Is it the policy, the governance, or the goodwill? Right now, policy setting. We are confused as a nation. Do we do coal or are we into renewable energy? Uh, are we going to ensure that, that our power generation is, is stable and that we look at the best options? Is it going to go private? Is it going to go stay in the hands of the state as an SAE? What's going to happen to mining in this country? Are we going to go simply as an extractive mining country, or are we going to go as a mining sector that adds value uh, through the, the enrichment of, of, of products that we mine? There are so many confusing policies in this country. We, we are not consistent. We almost are led by whoever pitches up on our shores and makes us an offer. We, we, we like a, like a, a spaza shop trader. Whoever is willing to pay more for the product, We'll, we'll get the product. It's, it's, it's bizarre that there isn't a consistent policy. We have Chapter 2, for example, in our Constitution, which deals with human rights. We are supposed to sign up to human rights charters across the world and support human rights activities across the world. Yet, in, in certain instances, we back down from where human rights violations are clear, and, and we back down to not sign declarations of the UN that, that bolsters human rights, simply because uh, of what other bigger business partners, bigger countries are instructing us to do. And so th there is this awareness within our midst that, that we are not good at policy setting. We are caving into whoever pitches up with more money or better offers to us. And, and that, that is the biggest danger I sense right now. We are mm. making our policies in the best interest of our people. We are making the policies in the best interest of what other players who pay us to want us to do. Now, just before we wrap up, I mean, I had some feedback from other people and, and uh, the Vice Chancellor of the UCT, uh, Prof. Mamokheti Pakeng, made the point that, you know, agreeing with most of the things that you and I would have said, there's, there's, there's some gains and there's, there's massive losses, but also, therefore, the, the concept of, you know, celebrating um, Freedom Day with just song and dance, I mean, that's just outdated. It needs to be, there needs to be something more substantial in terms of what happens on Freedom Day. So, so what should happen on Freedom Day? 
oh, my, my sense was that this should be what I call a sacred assembly. Freedom Day should, for the next five years, be a sacred assembly. It should be a moment of quiet pondering, of mourning that we've lost so much time, so many people, and literally in sacredness can recommit ourselves to the mandate of our founding fathers, those who wrote the Constitution, of which the President is one. We should say, Sir, Madam, what are the words of our Constitution? We, on this day, recommit to those words. It shouldn't be a song and dance. I'm tired of that. We are all tired of that. We are tired of flag wavings and, and dancers and uh, artists coming to perform as, 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 as necessary as income for the arts and culture sector is. This is not the time to do that. This is a time for us to ponder sincerely how we have lost the way and to seek the way back to the center of our constitution and to navigate our future from that point. Therefore, I call for a sacred assembly and not for a celebration. Okay, and then uh, another call you've made, and I've, and I've seen this, as, is a call to, to reach the length and breadth of our country with, with a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations. I mean, just tell me about that very quickly. Yeah, I, I, next week I'm off to Montague, Ashton, Bonnevale, Robertson, and I'm conducting community conversations, asking people uh, how they feel about a country 28 years after democracy, what works and what doesn't work. And so at grassroots level, with leaders, business leaders, politicians, local community, uh, individuals, parents, uh, single people, youth, I sit in conversation in groups of 60, and I, I sit and talk to people, and, and we have these amazing conversations to talk about, yeah, and, uh, about the future of this country. One of the big questions that I ask people to answer is, uh, there's a question I posted them called, if I had it my way. And so each person must answer the question and say, if I had it my way, what would I do? And what I hear from that are the most amazing answers to people saying, if they were president, or if they were the mayor, if they were the, the, the premier, or if they were the councillor, this is what they would do. We're busy documenting that because it's going to be a very insightful report back that we want to give to the president of this country to say, this is what people on the ground are saying. If they had a day away, this is what they would do, sir. And ultimately, it's, it's all. it should always be about uh, the people. Lorenzo Davids, great chatting to you. Lots to think about coming out of the conversation. And I think that point that you brought up at the very end, besides the, if I had it my way, the, the sense of solemnity around Freedom Day as opposed to song and dance, I think needs to be understood very, very clearly. Uh, thanks for your time, as always, and hopefully we'll chat soon. Thank you, Ashraf. Thank you so much for your show. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Lorenzo Davids, the Executive Director of the Justice uh, Fund and uh, the Development Impact Fund, um, and also popularizing the need for, for the middle class in the main to, to use public transport by, by doing daily commuting by train around the Western Cape every single day. You need to follow him on, um, on Twitter because you'll know all about what he does then, Urban Low. So U-R-B-A-N-L-O, Urban Low. Follow him on Twitter. Another person you should connect with is Professor Jonathan Janssen. He has lots to say around education. We'll talk about that next.